Yeah, um, uh, so, so talking about sharks and the, so that's the white again. Okay, yeah, talking about sharks, what is interesting about, oh, sorry, it's talking about sharks, what is, in, it's, 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 it's interesting, sorry. It's of course the problem in conservation. I'm not gonna talk about that, of course, or all of that. Uh, they're also top predator. That's more interesting actually, because as being top predator, there's also, they're all controlling in some ways the whole system. And by removing sort of, um, individuals that are not adapted to the lower stage, well, they control in some ways the, the overall uh, uh, ecosystem. So in that sense, they're really important in the ecosystem. What they have special as well is that they're um, different from the whole things that Jeff was mentioning in the sense they don't have any pelagic larvae like most uh, sort of uh, um, organism has in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the reef and in, the, in, um, in sort of coastal habitat. And they have also very small population size often. And that's also a very interesting aspect because of course they can be more fragile to any kind of major change that can, that can happen. So in that sense, um, I'm gonna talk today uh, what I call the black tip story. So it's, it's the black tip shark that probably everybody knows around here. And um, uh, I'm gonna go through different sort of layer of uh, understanding uh, connectivity and how connectivity can be linked to in, in some ways to the behavior of those animals. So first of all, uh, one of the first study that, that I'm gonna talk about is the connectivity at the large scale. So, the, one of the things that when you're doing population genetic and that strikes people in the 80s, 90s, and even, even more recently, is that often you lacking finding genetic structure. You lacking in the ocean because ocean, it's sort of um, transporting everything everywhere. People were thinking actually that connectivity was, was what, very large in the 70s and 80s uh, um, because they were finding that population genetics, population genetic was showing homogeneity. What's in interesting in the black tip is that we get to some, something that is completely opposite. So here you've got a study that goes from the Red Sea basically to, the, to, the, um, to French Malaysia and then covers almost the overall, the overall range of the species. Uh, that's done on genetic and classical um, uh, microsatellites analysis. And then what we're finding is that overall, which I think that's uh, every single site, and even when we're going in, within French Malaysia, every single atoll has its own population, genetic population. So they are highly structured, like not a single signal uh, from the Red Sea, from Western Australia, from New Caledonia. Well, you've got Moria, where you've got a huge sampling. You got, and then several atolls in French Malaysia. They all show a single, a single uh, isolated population. So that was, to me, a kind of a surprise. I would have expected to have something more homogenized. And then, of course, here you got, of course, the Red Sea, very isolated, uh, the, the Western and Eastern Australia, but you can separate them genetically. The Polynesia looks all sort of together, but when we get a little bit more in close detail, well, you get here the society, and then you get here some of the Tomudu, some of the southern uh, islands as well. So really, we're on a system that there is, in some ways, a lack of connectivity between all those systems. And, and if you look at around here, you got two, two islands that are quite close, or two islands that are quite close, like Moray and Tetaroa. And they're both showing sort of a differentiated population. So here is, to me, something that is very important in terms of conservation for at least that species, is that the connectivity is very limited. And being able to show that just with classical population genetic, that often people were thinking that this is cannot show really sort of a, a clear patterns, this, this was, a, a, to me, a kind of a surprise. And um, one of the other things is that this is highly corrected with geographic distances, so you go genetic distances strongly corrected with geographic distances, which clearly show that there is exchange, but it's only limited to the narrow population, really. Uh, then we got to another part of the story that is the, I call the black tip in Moria. So Moria, it's a small island in French Malaysia, close by Tahiti, so I think that makes you for an idea and for a promotion. Uh, this is where <laughs> our research center is based, so you're welcome to come at any time, of course. Uh, and we have official collaboration with the Center of Excellence <laughs> in Australia, of course. And so we were interested to, to understand a little bit more what was happening on a local population. Now that we know that more or less each island has its own population and, and uh, its own population behaving differently uh, genetically. So we started with, um, what I know, what I've been doing for the last 10 years. So we started with genetic parentage analysis, and then we collected new, sort of, not new recruits, but perhaps I would say it, because uh, it's a little bit different. So perhaps are often occurring on the fringing reef in very shallow water. The main reason why they occur in very shallow water is because the adult try to eat them. Yeah, they're, 
they're not very nice with their, their own pups. So they go in very, very shallow water, like really 20 centimeter of water, and often less, actually. Really, they just, they just can't swim. And then we, co we collected adults all around, the, all around the places. So we got about 200 adults. We got about 60 perhaps. That was on one year only, to 12 and 8 years. And then we collect as well a few individuals, some juveniles, in a small island that is about a, uh, it's, it's, it's 25, 40, uh, 30 nautical miles. So it's about a, uh, six, 50 kilometers from, from Moria, that is called Tichara here, where we, where we saw there was a little bit of genetic difference between the two. And so we were interested in to, in to see how much we could uh, uh, at, uh, attribute uh, parents to, new, to a new recruit. So first of all, we were able to show that. Uh, so you got on the outer reef, you got the, the adult. On the fringing reef, you got the, the population. And so you, you can see that basically there are movement with females basically coming to those places to lie their pups. And then there is some that are doing sort of local retention. There's some that are moving from one side to the other. Um, nothing really new on that. So at least we were able to attribute uh, pups to, to the, the female. What was more interesting is that we were able to show that some female cross this sort of uh, area of open water and goes to lay their pup in Tichara. And there's several, actually. And that is uh, an area where you have about 2,000 meters of deep water. Uh, these are oceanic islands. So you got that sort of individuals as a female that cross the whole, uh, the whole sort of uh, area and goes here to lay the, the, the that, that, that was quite of a surprise, especially because we had some idea about the fact that the, those populations were genetically in some ways differentiated. The other thing is that this uh, by two is that it's for two consecutive years. So a same female from two years in a row went back to that place to lie their pups. So we are still working on that, but we have idea that might be there's some phylopatry processes here where there's a sort of, uh, like it's been suggested also for turtle, they go back basically to the places where they're born, a little bit like salmon, I would say. There's a lot, a lot of uh, other examples like that. So that, that was a surprise. And that, what is a surprise to me is that you're crossing such a very dangerous area for them because well, there's much bigger sharks in that area that can certainly go through them. So that was that movement that was surprising. Um, then we look at movement within the islands of Moria and then through the adult to see how much they move, how do they organize, how do they sort of um, behave between themselves. So we did that by um, acoustic tracking. I'm not going to go into detail of those methods. Most of people know those things. Um, you basically was receiver, and then you put a, uh, uh, an, a transmitter on the fish, and then you know uh, when the fish come close to one of the receiver and you know that the fish is there basically. So for example, you can see that here you got four different receivers, they've got different color. You can see that that, that individual clearly spends the whole night on the outside and close to here and they spend the whole day inside the lagoon close to that receiver. And then you can see that for example, this one stayed whole night and day close to that one. So there's very different behavior according to the different individuals. And when we look around Morea, well, we basically have three different coastlines, and each of those coastlines have has its own sort of a group, social group, and they stay and they don't move except for the time of the reproduction, where they clearly go from one place to the other, from one coast to the other, to lay their puffs. But then, once they establish in some places, they clearly don't move. And if we go to the, the next step, which we try to look at within, again, uh, in Moria, we, we try to look at how much association those sort of um, uh, community were working. And then we, we look at through uh, individual sort of um, uh, um, um, visual survey, we looked at how much we could see the two individuals together. So basically, when you go in the water, you, go, you, you take um, a look of all the individuals you identify in one spot, and then you look at from the shape of the fin and the color of the fin, you're able to identify each individual. And then you look at how many times you see two individuals at the same, on the same dive, on the same places. And from that, you can draw what we call network uh, association, network network. And what we're finding is that on this case, we were finding that four communities that were behaving just in the northern area of the island. And this association was very strong and very stable through time. So that was something that was surprising to us is that how much stable those communities were there. Here you've got those individuals that are male and female. There's basically groups of uh, 
15 to 30 individuals, and that's stable. The whole year, the whole, actually this is a study that lasted for two years, and then this is really, really, really stable in terms of uh, our community. And if you look at Ron, how it is distributed spatially, is that you've got those four community, and you've got here the color where there, there are uh, sort of uh, occurring, and then you've got a community that, like that blue one occurs in that area, and only in that area. You never see an individual of that community that goes in this area. Then you got that sort of red community that occurs, that occurs in that area, and you never see one individual going in that area. And then you got here, you got sort of uh, two communities that sort of overlap a little bit with this community that is sort of more inside, that goes a little bit in that area, that goes a little bit in that area. And there is almost no overlap on the normal situation, except when you get into the reproduction period, and then on the reproduction period, that's where you have the overlap between those three communities, only during that period and, on, and only at that time. So there's clearly here a, a sort of a very, very organized situation, much, actually much more uh, structured than we were thinking at the beginning. So when you go in a, in a place and you see a shark, at least a, a black tip, and we did actually the same thing for a lemon and for lemon shark, we got exactly the same result. They're really, really stable in time uh, and that's, and through from one year to the other. Even if they, they move then for production or if they move for uh, lying their pups. Um, so, and I'll be probably gaining time. Uh, what, what we can say about connectivity on the case, on the specific case of shark, is that connectivity is strongly related to behavior, and understanding the behavior will make understanding the, com the community. Many species of sharks are known to aggregate it. Uh, we all know those type of photos, and we're all sort of uh, impressed by those, those type of photos. But this is not only the case for shark. If you go into the land, you go into some of the big apex mammals, I would say, you get into the same situation where you have clearly those communities, they form those communities. Some are uh, uh, more um, uh, sort of uh, individual isolated individuals, but some are really forming those communities, and those communities are really socially organized. And that's, uh, in this socially organized, you also have a hierarchy of which one is the most important or has the priority. And this is also something that we've been working on, on well, if you give food, uh, which one will be the one, the first one to come, which one will be the next one to come? And there's also here a clear sort of hierarchy in that. Um, we've, been, we've been studying, and I'm not presenting that, also trying to understand on those small community how much it, it is uh, uh, interaction with the genetics. We haven't found any specific genetic sort of um, difference or homogeneity between those groups. It seems to be they mainly form sort of random, genetically randomly. This needs to be confirmed, and we have more things. But clear, oops, sorry. But clearly, oops. But clearly, to me, is that the behavior here that is a sort of um, of a, 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 dry, a driver for the connectivity of those type of species, uh, to my point of view. And of course, it's the it's the fidelity in a site. It's the it's the the, the spatial organization that lead in some ways to that sociality that we are able to to uh, demonstrate and to show. Um, so on the overall, uh, we can say that there's clearly a highly structured population from what we've seen on the large scale and on small scale. Uh, that fine scale uh, uh, allows to enter into the social behavior of those individuals, of those community. There is that stability that we've seen. Uh, there is a, a dynamic that um, uh, would make, because they're very small t population size, like an islands like Moria, we estimated the overall population of, of, of black tip that's around between 400 and 500 individuals. That's very small in terms of population size. This is something that you would expect maybe to have some inbreeding, but probably likely because they do those mixing and those strategy that makes them to make their social sort of uh, structure at one stage, but then they disorganize that social structure at the, at the time of the reproduction, that sort of avoid in some ways the inbreeding. Uh, we also know that sharks are very slow evolving uh, genomes, so likely also this is, has a, is an interplay with the inbreeding. And so there is um, also we coming to some direct evidence of uh, uh, some of, uh, uh, reproductive phylopatry with the idea that they come back to the same places. And to me, this idea of phylopatry, this, this idea of structure has to be integrated certainly in the context of uh, shark conservation. And I think I've got nothing to add. And thank you very much.